This is Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And we turn now to a topic that we're all familiar with, or are we? A new book, The Fluoride Deception, unearths the mystery of how a grim workplace poison and the most damaging environmental pollutant of the Cold War was added to our drinking water and toothpaste. A chronicle of the abuse of power and of the manufacture of state-sponsored medical propaganda. The Fluoride Deception reveals how a secretive group of powerful industries, all of which faced extensive litigation for fluoride pollution, collaborated with officials from the National Institute of Dental Research to launder fluoride's public image. So today we're going to talk about this new book, The Fluoride Deception. It's by Christopher Bryson, looks at the background of the fluoridation debate. According to Chris, research challenging fluoride safety was either suppressed or not conducted in the first place. He says fluoridation is a triumph not of medical science, but of U.S. government spin. He joins us in the studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. Well, can you just give us the history? Um, what is this in the water? Where is it? Is it all over this country? And why is it there? Uh, it's in about two-thirds of the water supply in the United States. Uh, however, uh, the United States is virtually alone I in the addition of uh, fluoride to its uh, water supplies. 98% uh, of Western Europe, for example, don't add fluoride to the water supplies in many communities. Countries there who have fluoride in the water have taken it out. Uh, the theory behind fluoride is that the addition of uh, fluorides to water supplies will uh, give you less cavities in your mouth, and that's been the prevailing uh, wisdom of the public health establishment since 1950 when they signed off on that. Uh, my book, The Fluoride Deception, challenges you, uh, requires you to think of fluoride differently. Uh, the book unearths a secret history. Uh, I, uh, this book is premised on 10 years of investigative work going into our, the archives of the United States Manhattan Project, going into... Uh, That's in the making of the atomic yeah, bomb. Yeah, the, the Manhattan Project was the uh, World War II, the very secret project to make the atomic bomb. I went into industry archives, a very uh, large, significant industry archive out of the University of Cincinnati, and found that the very same... Uh, health researcher, Dr. Robert Kehoe, who headed up the Kettering Laboratory at the University of Cincinnati. He spent his entire uh, career telling the United States uh, public health community that adding lead to gasoline was safe. Uh, that's now being discredited. Robert Kehoe was also one of two leading public health uh, scientists uh, saying that adding fluoride to water was uh, uh, safe and, and good for children. Uh, so that, that's the, uh, some of the material that this book uh, gets into. Well, the, uh, the, the, common, the common understanding that many of us have in this country is that there's been a sort of a, uh, a persistent anti-fluoridation movement in this country, but it's been considered sort of at the fringes of American society. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how the, the development of the atomic <coughs> bomb was involved in the whole fluoride campaign? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's a media slur, Juan. The uh, grassroots citizen movement against water fluoridation that uh, came into being almost immediately in 19... The Public Health Service had been against adding fluoride to water uh, for years. In 1950, they did a complete uh, about, uh, about face, so a flip-flop. And uh, the uh, citizens across the country were... Uh, outraged that this rat poison was going to be added to their water supplies. That, that's Today, the fluoride that goes in our drinking water is almost exclusively raw industrial pollution from the Florida phosphate industry. It's uh, waste that's scrubbed from the smokestacks and uh, trucked in tankers and dumped into uh, reservoirs. That's a raw industrial uh, poison, hydrofluorosilicic acid. Wait a second, you said rat poison? Yeah, fluoride, uh, sodium fluoride has been used as a rat poison. Uh, for, for a long time. And, but again, the connection to the, to sure. the, the atom bomb. Yeah, sure. Let me just get back to the... Uh, in fact, the... Uh 
Grassroots movement against water fluoridation is a precursor of the environmental movement of today. It has many political uh, uh, hues, m m many uh, dif different groups, conservatives, uh, liberals, republicans, ac across the board. And it was led, not by nutcases, but by scientists and doctors with uh, long established pedigrees safeguarding public health. The leading scientist opposing water fluoridation was a man by the name of Dr. George Walbot. He had first warned the United States in the 19th fifties about the danger of cigarette smoking. He had warned of the danger of fatal allergic reaction to penicillin. So this is, uh, that, that's the background. It's not a fringe movement. It's been marginalized by the media and hasn't been terribly well reported on. My book seeks to address that. The connection to the Manhattan Project, I mentioned one uh, leading fluoride researcher, uh, scientist, uh, Robert Kehoe. The second was a name, uh, a fellow a scientist by the name of Dr. Harold Carpenter Hodge. Uh, for most of the Cold War, Dr. Harold Carpenter Hodge was the leading scientist assuring uh, the nation of the safety and effectiveness of adding fluoride to water supplies. Dr. Harold Carpenter Hodge wore two hats. He had his public hat. He had his private hat. Dr. Harold Carpenter Hodge was the senior toxicologist for the Manhattan Project to build the world's first atomic bomb. Fluoride is a key ingredient in industry. It's used for making aluminum. It's used for making steel. It's used for producing high-octane gasoline, uh, to name a few industries. The dental story is a minor story, the real issue. The real issue is pollution outside these industrial plants and pollution inside the plants. Industry are on the hook for millions and millions and millions of dollars in potential damages for injury to workers. My book uncovers a medical study commissioned by industry at the University of Cincinnati in the 1950s, which showed that fluoride is profoundly injurious to, to lungs and lymph nodes in experimental animals. That study was buried. Uh, the significance of that study is that had it been shown to the standard setters, the fluoride that men and workers, uh, men and women workers in these industrial plants breathe, the threshold levels would have been set much lower. You know, that, that's a crime. What that means is that tens of thousands of workers in factories have been injured as a result of the suppression of uh, this medical information. Anyway, to return to your question, the Manhattan Project needed fluoride to enrich uranium. That's how they did it uh, in the gaseous diffusion plants. The biggest industrial building in the world for a time was the gaseous fluoride gaseous diffusion plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The Manhattan Project and Harold Hodge, as the senior toxicologist for the Manhattan Project, were scared stiffless that workers would realize that the fluoride they were going to be breathing inside these plants was going to injure them, and that the Manhattan Project, the key, the key of U.S. strategic power in the Cold War era would be jeopardized because the Manhattan Project and the industrial contractors making the atomic bomb would be facing uh, uh, all these lawsuits from workers, all these lawsuits from farmers living around these industrial plants, and uh, so Harold Hodge assures us that fluoride is safe and good for children. Very hard to get an, a public, uh, a doctor, uh, an expert witness in a court to say, if it's good for children, how can it be harmful for workers? So, so in essence, the uranium hexafluoride that was necessary for the enriching of, uh, of uranium and produced this byproduct and obviously this waste of, uh, of of uh, fluoride. Uh, it's, in my mind, it sounds very similar to the issue of depleted uranium. Again, depleted uranium being a byproduct of the nuclear industry and the need then to sanitize the w these waste products uh, from our nuclear industry for, for the public to get rid of them, in other words, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's, it, could you talk a little bit about the role of Edward Bernays, this, the, the father of uh, propaganda or, or public relations uh, in America in, uh, in convincing the public about this? Yeah, yeah. Edward Bernays is a legendary figure in, uh, in, the, in the 20th century. He was Sigmund Freud's nephew. And uh, Bernays, uh, there was a biography a couple of years ago of him which revealed that it was Edward Bernays. He was, he was married to a, to a feminist, and he was very attuned to the liberal current in the 20th century. And Bernays was a, a Machiavellian genius. He's the father of public relations. He understood that you could har harness that liberal sentiment for commercial gain. And he had women march in the 19s. He had suffragettes march in the 1916 Easter parade.
Street in New York City, holding cigarettes as torches of liberty. Uh, Edward Bernays was working for uh, the American Tobacco Company and George Hill. You know, he was. Uh, so my book, The Fluoride Deception, uh, uncovers for the first time correspondence between Bernays and the New York City uh, uh, Health Commissioner, Dr. Leona Baumgartner, in which Bernays says that helping out on the fluoride campaign in New York in the early 1960s interested him because it related to problems of engineering consent. So Bernays was the, uh, he was the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. We only have a minute to go, but I wanted to ask how fluoride then ended up in the water of each community. Where does the decision get made, and how did those debates play out? Uh, the Public Health Service endorsed it in 1950, and uh, but by and large, it's not given over to referendum. This is a democracy issue, because when it is submitted to the vote, uh, Far more often than not, voters give it the thumbs down. Mostly, it's by fiat or dictate. In New York City, for example, it was the Board of Estimate uh, that, uh, that, that, that signed up for it, uh, that uh, gave it the green light. So uh, that's... Uh, and where does it come from? The, where does fluoride come uh, from? No, like, for example, the water in the New York's uh, water supply, the fluoride in the For water supply. Where do they bring <laughs> it, ship it in from? Do they have to dump it on a regular basis into the reservoirs? Yeah, the fluoride comes up in specially, we were talking about 9-11. Since 9-11, there's been a lot of concern about the safety of these fluoride tankers. So toxic are the contents of the fluoride tankers coming from the Florida phosphate industry up to New York City or all over the country. That that's a, that there's a profound danger that those tank tankers will be hijacked. Christopher Bryson, we're going to have to leave it there. He is author of The Fluoride Deception. This is Democracy Now! As we wrap up,